ba 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 Okay, that's the only part I know. Uh, <laughs> the road to the Olympics is a difficult one, but today we're gonna talk about like the actual road to the Olympics, like like physically traveling to the Olympics, which for me was a crazy situation. It took 60 hours from leaving my house to getting to the Olympic Village. Like it was crazy. I didn't even think I was gonna make it. So let's get this story started. My journey began in beautiful Switzerland where I was getting some last minute training in before the games. I had traveled there to compete in the Locks Open, which was the last Olympic qualifier. We had about a week until opening ceremonies and Malta was still trying to organize my flight. Because China was still not allowing any flights into China, only specific Olympic chartered planes could go into China. And there was like a limited amount of these planes leaving from throughout the world each day. Unfortunately, there weren't gonna be any available flights from San Francisco westbound China. So I was gonna have to go from San Francisco to Istanbul and then Istanbul to China. Basically the entire other way around the world. This was gonna be the only way to make it possible. So I was gonna have to get out of Switzerland like ASAP to get on this flight. Then the logistics of getting the actual gear for the Olympics came up. I didn't have any of the opening ceremonies outfits I was supposed to wear or the village wear or like any of the clothes because once you're at the Olympics, you basically wear a uniform the entire time. And I had none of that. So I headed to the Zurich airport and someone from Malta flew up to Switzerland with bags of uniforms and accessories for me and my coach, Brett. Going to the Olympics finally started feeling real once I saw those bags. I was like, wow, Olympics gear, here we go. They also gave me a set of two credentials for me and my coach, Brett. They told me that these credentials are the single most important thing in the entire bag. Like don't even have them in check baggage, put them on your carry-on because if you lose these, you cannot get into the Olympics. China wasn't issuing any visas. These Olympic credentials were gonna be our visas to literally get into China. Then the next morning I got on a flight to San Francisco. Also anti shout out to the security agent who confiscated my solo deodorant before a 12 hour flight. Not cool, dude. I got to my gate and when I sat down to wait for the flight, I looked through my backpack and I did not see the credentials anywhere. I seriously started to panic. I made a $20 long distance call back to the hotel. I had the desk receptionist go to the room, search through the room. She searched through every single drawer, couldn't find the credentials. I lost the most important thing. All I could hope was somehow I had repacked them into the check bag without thinking. And there's nothing I could do to check until I got back to San Francisco. So I got onto my flight. I landed in San Francisco on January 29th. And the first thing I did was rip open the bag and look for the credentials. I breathed easy for the first time when I found them. And I knew that at least I hadn't blown everything yet. I only had 40 hours in San Francisco before I had to get back on a plane to China. So I scrambled doing final preparations. I checked out everything Malta had given me and then I repacked it all. We had special luggage tags that we had to print out and tape to every single bag so that our bags would end up at the right village because there was three different Olympic villages in China. I also wanted to change my hair color for the Olympics. So I bleached it out and bleached it out and I completely fried it. It is breaking off in chunks from the bleach damage and it is the consistency of elastic. I thought I was gonna lose all of my hair before the Olympics, which was scary, but what can you do? I was running out of time. I also got a pedicure with Ricky because the dogs needed to be in top form for the most important event in my life. Woof! And just like that, it was time to go. So I said bye to Ricky and I headed back to the airport to head to China. I did a little photo op with my coach, said goodbye to my parents. One, two, three. Since they weren't allowed to come to China. And then it was off to board the plane for our first leg to Istanbul. The flight to Istanbul was pretty uneventful. I watched a few movies, slept a bit, hoped no one around me had COVID. And that's about it. When we landed in Istanbul, I was really surprised to see snow on the ground. We were gonna have eight hours before the official Olympic charter that went to Beijing. So I killed time checking out the squat toilets, looking at the treats in the shops, and then hanging out at the airport lounge. Brett passed out so hard that I like thought he was dead. I couldn't wake him up. It was insane. I have never seen someone sleep so deeply in my life. Around midnight, our chef de mission from Malta arrived. Her name was Charlene and we hung out and waited for them to announce the gate that we would go to for the 2 a.m. flight to Beijing. Eventually we headed to the gate and this was the moment that the Olympics like 
really, really felt real. I saw all these athletes from all the different countries and their matching outfits and everyone was going to the gate together. And I was like, oh my God, this plane is getting loaded with Olympians. Like these are all people from all over the world going to the Olympics. Like we're doing it. I'm here. We're going to the Olympics. And then this is when the trauma started. There were a ton of crazy protocols that we needed to follow that I'll dive into in another video. But specifically, this issue had to do with something called the green code. There was this app from China that we had to download and upload our test results into, and then they'd get sent to China and they'd get approved and we would get this green QR code that we needed to board the plane. Charlene and Brett both got their green code within like 15 minutes of sending through the application, but I had been waiting on mine for eight hours. And when the plane started to board, my green code was still orange saying processing. We frantically started trying to call people in Malta, trying to call contacts in China to figure out why mine was processing, why it still hadn't gone through. And we couldn't get a hold of anyone. It was the middle of the night, no one was answering, and we had no resources to get help to find out why my code wasn't through. It got to the final few minutes before they were gonna close the doors. Charlene and Brett got on the plane because these QR codes had a limited time that they were valid for. So the two support staff of Malta got on the plane without the only athlete from Malta. And I was stuck there watching everyone leave without me. The gates closed and I was alone in this terminal in Istanbul and I felt so helpless and abandoned and just like hopeless that that was it. I wasn't going to go to China. We had no idea why, but they weren't approving my documents. I cried right there in the terminal. I just felt like the Olympics were gone. I had to go to the main ticket office and change my flight to the 2 a.m. flight the next day to the Olympics because there was only one a day. I headed to the airport hotel, I got a room, and I went into the room and felt totally, I don't know the word for it, like hopeless, depressed, sad. I had a total panic attack. I was crying, I was hyperventilating. I was freaking out. It was a terrible moment. Like I thought my Olympic journey was done. Between panic attacks, I undid my braids and then I took this picture because my hair looked really cool and it was so dead that I didn't know if it ever looked that cool again. And then I took a picture where I tried to capture how terrible I felt because I told myself, at some point you will not feel this terrible, things will be better. So I want you to save this picture so you can look back on it and see even when you feel this terrible and this empty, things will turn around eventually. So I tried to capture my lowest moment possible. And then I was up for two hours dealing with someone from Malta, trying to figure out what went wrong with my code. And it turned out that because I had had COVID in December, there was a separate form that we had filled out and submitted to China at that time. But they didn't tell us, they also wanted that form attached to my green code application. And so they considered it missing. And that's why it wasn't approved. Something so simple and nobody could tell us that before the flight went off. So anyways, I got my green code approved and then had like 22 hours to wait for my next flight. After 32 hours in that freaking Istanbul airport, I was so ready to get out of there. So I headed to the new departure gate at like 1 a.m. the next day, had my green QR code and I was like, please approve me. And they're like, all right, you can board. Finally, I was almost maybe going to make it to the Olympics. Still had to jump through all the hoops, but things were looking good. I saw that boarding to Beijing sign. I walked onto the plane and we were moving along. <laughs> now I was finally on the flight that had all the other Olympic athletes. Everyone was in their outfits. There were these guys who were like seven feet tall and really good looking. And I found out later they were the Lithuanian ice hockey team. Again, had a pretty non-eventful flight. They didn't serve us like any special food or do anything special or say like, congratulations, we're heading to the Olympics. Like it was basically just a regular flight. So that was kind of a letdown. I thought there'd be something special about the flight to the Olympics, but it was pretty basic, just filled with athletes. We landed in China in a weirdly empty terminal. They had a whole section of the airport that was just closed off for the Olympics because they didn't want us to actually have any contact with any mainland Chinese people because we were in a completely quarantined bubble during the entire Olympics. 
So there was like cute decorations on the walls and there were little signs that talked about the Olympics and stuff, but they were all kind of decorations just hiding the fact that we were inside barriers. There was like barricades blocking anywhere we could possibly go. So we were all funneled into just the specific places we were allowed to be. And the first place they funneled us to was the COVID testing. This was like the last thing I needed to do to make it to the Olympic Village. They did a throat test that went so far back down my throat. I like barely didn't puke on the girl doing it. And then they did a nose swab that went so far up my nose and kept going up that it felt like my nose was about to start bleeding. Like I've never had two more traumatic COVID swabs than those two. And it was back to back and then they're like, okay. And I was like, oh my God, I'm been, I've been violated. <laughs> um, but anyways, we made it through. All of the workers were in these crazy, like full on hazmat suits, like feet to hands, face, everything was covered. Like what you see in an emergency biological contamination situation. It was crazy. It was like being in like an apocalypse movie. They had all the bags sorted to get on the buses, but I had no baggage because it had arrived an entire day before and Brett brought it to our apartment in the village. The whole process of like deboarding the plane and getting to the bus, I should add, took maybe like an hour and a half. And then we got on the bus, we drove through the airport. We had like a little police escort thing with the lights and stuff. Uh, saw a beautiful sunset, saw the Olympics mascots around, and then just had like a, probably like three hour bus ride to the village. Might've been more than that. Like every 35 minutes, they made the bus take a 15 minute break. So it was a very long trip. But eventually we got to the processing part of the village and I saw those giant Olympic rings. And that was like the coolest thing. Like, oh, I got shivers now. Like just having the memory of like looking out the window and seeing those rings. And it was like, oh, I actually did it. There's been so many times along this path that I did not think I would do it. It's taken 60 hours, 60 hours from leaving San Francisco, but I am here now at the Olympics processing. I can go in, go through some security checks. They scan us, do all this stuff. And then I'm in the Olympic village and I see the whole area of all the flags of every single country. And each flag gets raised when that country arrives. So there were still some flags that hadn't been raised, but man, just seeing that sea of flags of people from all over the world <laughs> was so cool. I don't know why I'm getting emotional right now, but yeah. And then <laughs> the first person I ran into was Kralt. Woo! I made it. I made it. 60 hours. I'm here. <laughs> After being on such a long and exhausting journey, it felt so good to see one of my best friends and to like, be like, oh my God, I am safe now. I am here. But my night wasn't done yet because once I got to my apartment, I had to dye my hair because it was still blonde and it was like 11 p.m. Opening ceremonies were the next day and I needed to get some color in for opening ceremonies. So I stayed up till like 3 a.m. dyeing all of my hair and it looked really good. Then I went to sleep, woke up the next morning. It froze because it was so cold out. I left my apartment with wet hair this morning and it is frozen. Oh my God. <laughs> and the rest is the story for the other videos. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching my journey of getting to the Olympics. It was so crazy and exhausting, but like all stressful things, like eventually it ends and there's good things at the end. So thanks for watching. See you next time.